Good morning. It's great to be in the house of the Lord today. Good to see everyone out on this rainy Sunday morning. And, uh, but we're thankful to be here and thankful you came out. And we're just looking forward to what the Lord's going to do in and through our service. And I see uh, several faces here today that I um, have not met before. And uh, we are thankful you're here and we're honored to have you as you've come today to worship with us. And you just make yourself at home today here at Victory Baptist Church. Uh, just a couple of announcements just to let you know about. Um, we did reach our goal. Our seven missionaries will receive checks next week toward their ministry. Our Christmas goal, which we extended it into the first uh, Sunday of the new year, was $7,000. And given to date, we have reached $7,265.70. Five cents. So all I want to say, yeah, is thank you, thank you, church, for giving. This is a church that loves to support missions, loves the furthering of the gospel message, and we wanted to make for certain that these missionaries have what they need to be able to further the gospel where God has planted them at. So thank you, thank you, church. I know that um, we got a little bit of a late start. But I told you I believed in you, and we were able to do it. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Also, just real quick here as well, um, at the end of the service, just to give you a little, um, just a little bit of a piece of the cake. Yeah, I'm going to give you the whole cake yet, all right? You just get a little tiny bite. But I have exciting news for you at the end of the service pertaining to our deacons. Uh, we have been able to get uh, four men that um, have accepted the call to serve this local body here. And uh, we will have a total of five, um, including Brother Walt. But we have four, and I'll tell you about them at the end of the service. So excited to be able to train two of them. Looking forward to an ordination service as well. But uh, just giving you a little bit of a head um, start on that. We'll talk about that after the invitation today. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Max. He's going to come up. And help me this morning with a baby dedication. So if you would, brother, you just come on up. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to have a very special service this morning. And it's a, a baby dedication service. And I'd like to ask for the parents and the little ones to come on up and be up here. One of the things to remind ourselves is what the Lord says in Psalms 127 where he tells us that children are a heritage of the Lord. And although the parents are very, very proud of their, their new ones, the Lord is too. And it's a very exciting time when, when a new child comes into the family and there's no greater moment than when the parents realize and sense that their children are truly a gift from God. And dedicating the child acknowledges God's sovereignty not only over the child, but over the mom and dad. And the parents, as they present their child, they're presenting him before the Lord and before his people, asking for grace and wisdom and carrying out those responsibilities. And that's a joint effort with everybody here. They're asking for our help. And it takes a lot of folks to help raise a little one, the mom and dad, but all of us too, that that are part of the church as far as teachers and helpers, and it's all our responsibility. And I want to ask uh, Brother Jason Kendra first, and Jason and Emily, and by coming forward, you to hereby declare your desire and to your dedication to yourself and to your babies and to Jesus Christ, do you do this dedication today? And in the 6th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, the Bible tells us in verse 4 where Moses speaks unto Israel, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. He said, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And then he says, These words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. And he was speaking to a lot of young families that day, a lot of mothers and dads that had their child with them that day. He says, Thou shalt teach them diligently 
and to thy children. The things that he commanded. He said, you'll teach them to your children. And shall talk of them when thou settest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down. And then when thou risest up. And do you promise to these families, do you promise to learn God's word so that you will be, that will be in your hearts? And do you promise to teach God's word diligently to your children? And I ask also the grandparents to stand at this time that is in support of these families. And you're involved in it just as much. Because he says in Proverbs 17, 6, grandchildren are a crown for the ages. Probably more exciting than it was for your own children. The grandchildren are very, very special. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Jason and Kendra and Justin and Emily have brought their family before you. I pray first for all of them as parents, and I pray that you would give them grace and wisdom to carry out their responsibilities and to help them to be godly examples in their home. I pray that their home would be a place where each life lives for each other and all live for you. And for Miriam and Anna Kate and the babies here today, we dedicate them to you. I pray that they would be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and that they would be trained in the way that they should go. I pray that one day they would trust you as their own personal Savior for the forgiveness of sins. Amen. All right. Aren't you excited to have babies? Let's go ahead and stand this morning as we swing. As we sing. Swing. <laughs> you go first. Uh, you know I will. Swing wide the gates. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Thank you. 
Your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after Man, if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9 and also some other verses following after that. But what a wonderful song. The goodness of our God. And we talk about how wonderful and how mighty He is and what He has done. What He is doing and will continue to do. We should give Him the praise honor and all glory. Amen. If you would stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. John chapter 5, starting in verse number 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of important folk, or impotent folk, excuse me, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first at the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. 
When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent uh, man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this honor to be here today. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done so far in the service. We thank you for the baby dedication. We thank you, Father, that we've been led to the throne room as we've been able to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, also for this short period of time, help me today as your messenger to say what needs to be heard. Help me today to speak truth. Help me today to speak with clarity, to be concise. Father, also, I pray for those under the sound of my voice. They will be attentive to listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say to them today. Maybe someone today needs a Savior. Someone today needs to be saved. If that's the situation for whoever it may be, I pray they'd come today. Also for those that are dealing with a lot of difficult circumstances, they're overwhelmed, they're just really going through a difficult time, I pray that they'd know that they can come to you and find the source of peace and comfort that they so desire. Father, we love you. We thank you once again for this privilege. And we just ask all these things in the name above every name, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. At St. Anne's Church in Jerusalem, there has been a lot of archaeological digging that has been done over a long period of time. And during these deep excavations, it's been revealed that they have possibly found the ancient pool of Bethesda. The Hebrew name Bethesda has been spelled various ways. It's been given different interpretations over time. The meaning, some say it means the house of mercy. Some believe it to be the house of grace. But others say it means just the place of the two outpourings of where the fresh water would come into that location. There is historical and archaeological evidence that the two adjacent pools of water served this area during ancient times. So that gives you a little bit of a background on the pool of Bethesda that we are speaking about here today. But here we see within this passage of scripture that we read a very interesting story. An interesting passage of scripture that you possibly have read over many, many times, maybe in your own personal devotion, maybe just through reading the Word of God. But it's an interesting passage for several different reasons, and I want us to look at those today. Well, first of all, we see the waiting crowd in verses 1 through 3. It says that after there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches, and in these lay a great multitude of impotent people, of folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Now just picture it just for a moment. We don't know how many people were actually at this pool who were scattered around this area, but I can imagine that if you were just an observer to this situation, you'd see a lot of people laying down. You might see a lot of people that have someone there helping them to stand. You may see a lot of people that are shivering from sickness. You would see a lot of different people there for a lot of difficult and just harmful and ugly situation. But here we see here, if you can picture it, there's these sick folk coming and they're gathered around, and they're waiting for their chance to get to this water that they've heard about so many times. And they think inside their mind, if I can get to the water and beat the others, I'm going to be made whole. I'm going to be healed. And oftentimes we see here the impotent. We see the weak people, the weak that are unable to get where they need to go. The blind, they can't see. They had to have someone there helping them, guide them. Walking alongside them, pointing them and saying, this is the direction you need to go. 
the lame, the crippled, laying there, unable to move, laying there possibly as this man was on a mat, unable to move for who knows how long, and then withered, useless limbs that are just morally wasted. They're unable to move their limbs on their bodies. But this condition that we see here with this man that is here, that is within the area here of the Pool of Bethesda, is the situation that is common today of many today in society. There's many people in our world that are hurting. There are many people in our world that are very difficult in their circumstances. They're going through a lot of difficult situations. They're waiting for some kind of political or religious movement or something special to really come to aid them and to save them and help them in their dire hour. And you've got many that are like that. I've talked about this before. People going through difficult issues. They'll go grab a book and read it and say, well, this is going to solve my problem. I'll call this person on the telephone. They told me if I go down to this one church and they do this little service here and they give me this little cup of water to drink, it'll solve all my problems. If I go and go to this place all the way across the country and talk to this one specialist, it'll solve all my problems. Well, hey, there might be a little bit good in those situations. But if someone's down and out, if they're looking for hope, if they're looking for a way to find peace and comfort through this difficult situations, the only place that's going to come from is Jesus. That's where it's going to come from. And oftentimes people will do this. They'll look for answers to their issues. But this is a picture of all who need salvation in Christ. It's a pitiful scene. And today when we look in our world, it's a pitiful scene to see so many people searching for answers when the true answer is only in Jesus. But not only that, we see this wishful chance. Look at verse number 4. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the waters Whosoever then after the first troubling the water stepped in, it was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now, many of your modern translations of the Bible actually omit the end of John chapter 5, verse number 3, and all of verse number 4. But the event and the man's actual words in John 5, verse number 7, would make little sense if these verses are eliminated. You ever been reading something before and you're thinking, I have no idea about why they jumped from this to that. They must have left something out. So if you don't know why all of this has taken place, it's because that has actually been omitted here. But we see here the desire of the multitude. These desperate people at the pool were concerned about only one Thing, when they went there, they were all talking among themselves, I'm going to get healed today. Something's going to happen to me today. I guarantee you on the way there, they weren't talking about politics. They were talking about, this is my chance today. Okay? On the way there, they probably weren't talking about money. How much money do you owe me? How much money do I owe you? No, they were talking about Today's my day to get to where I think I need to be. It wasn't about entertainment. Did you catch what happened last night on the Roman news? No, that's not what they're talking about. Did you happen to hear about what's going on in the community day at the get-together? No, they're not talking about those things. It was getting in the water before anyone else. Their eyes were glued on the water to move. You're being just so determined when you're going somewhere. It's just like with Titus. We went to a monster truck show yesterday. My first one I'd ever been to. His also. A lot of ours, our family. For the last three days, he thought every morning was time to go to the monster truck show. His mind was focused on one thing. I'm going to the monster truck show. I want to see those monster trucks. 
And here, within this passage of Scripture, all these people that were going for this wishful chance, this man included here in this passage of Scripture, he thought when he got there, I'm going today because I want something to happen to me. I want to be healed. But then we see here the disturbing of the water. The water is troubled within this passage of Scripture. Now, there's been much debate about this. I personally believe that this is something that was a superstition that was made up. This was something they had conjured in their mind to believe that if I go, this actually happens. Now, this water that they were going to, with it being a cool spring, there was medicinal purposes in this for their skin and for them to get into this. But they had heard these stories and they had heard things that had happened before and in their minds they believed if I got there, this is going to fix me. So, the dash for the pool, when it happened, when they saw something start to happen, oh, I'm telling you what, you remember Black Friday? We don't really have those anymore, but remember when they would open those doors and everybody would be standing outside beating on the glass let us in, let us in. You'd have people camping out along the sidewalk. All these people lined around the building. And as soon as that worker, who was very timid and probably shaking in his shoes because he was probably hoping or she was hoping, please don't run over me, please don't run over me, please don't run over me, don't hurt me. Because there's been people that have been killed in those crazy situations. But as soon as that door went click, And it slid open. Here come the droves of people inside the building. Running to get that famous toy or that cooking device or that big screen TV that wasn't going to work again after a month. They were coming to get all those things that meant so much to them. And I can almost imagine when they noticed something happening, they were crawling. They were moving. They had someone picking them up. Said, get me to the water. Get me there. Get me to where I need to be. So one got in and beat the others. And I don't know how they determined who got there. Hey, my somebody there standing saying, okay, you won, you lost. I don't know how all that worked out. But can you imagine being one that lost? And then you thought to yourself, rats, I lost again. Not me today. Someone beat me again. I'll never win anything. Maybe next time. This is where this man in this story fell. For 38 years, he'd been hoping. He'd been doing probably a little praying. We don't know what his spiritual condition was like, if he knew what to pray. But I'm sure he thought to himself, oh, please let me get in today. But here we see the woeful condition. Look at verses 5 through 7. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. That's a long time to be there without some type of issue. And what does it say here? In verse number 6, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that cause... He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, saying, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. I'm reminded of a story of sitting on a park bench once, looking gloom. Linus said to Charlie Brown, Sometimes it seems like night life has knocked me down. Do you ever feel that way? Well, Charlie Brown looked at Linus and said, no. He said, life has knocked me down and it keeps walking all over me each and every day. But this lame man in our passage of scripture may have felt like Charlie Brown. Knocked down, walked on, hurt and defeated. He was in the middle of a miserable situation for 38 years of his life. He knew nothing different than his current situation. Verse 14 tells us and seems like 
that seems to be that the indicator of his infirmity was the consequence of some sin that he had committed when he was younger. See, what does sin do to a person? Well, first of all, it affects a person's physical condition. We see that here. Lame, crippled, weak, unable to walk. Also, a social condition it affects. Lonely, no friends, no family, no one to help him whatsoever to get where he needs to go. It's like David who cried in a cave. In Psalm 142, verse number 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Sin makes a person feel lonely. This person's lonely social condition, but also an emotional condition, frustration. Now I want you to notice something very important here within this passage of Scripture as we read. Jesus asked him, Wilt thou be made whole? But he doesn't answer the question as Jesus asked it. He only states his frustration. You ever had someone ask you a question about how you're doing and then they go into complaining about something else and they're thinking, I didn't ask for your life story, I just asked for an answer to my question. But here he goes into his frustration. He admits his total inability to reach the pool of water. See, when someone reaches the point to admit they can't do anything to save themselves, they are in a position to trust Jesus to save them. And oftentimes that's when we get to the end of the rope, to the end of the road, to where we realize, I've tried every avenue, I've tried all things. Jesus will save me when we should start in the very beginning because He offers salvation to all people. But we also see here his spiritual condition, which was hopeless. See, the hopeless condition is for all those people who do not have Christ as their Savior. You're walking around aimlessly. You have no direction to where to go. You're walking around in a hopeless situation. But the Bible tells us without Christ, having no hope and without God in the world, but with Christ there is hope for all people. There's hope for all men and Men, women, boys and girls. See, the lame man lying by the pool is a picture of an unsaved individual trying to be saved by keeping the law. Oh, if I'll only do this. Oh, if I'll only do that. But following the law is not going to get you salvation. You can try your best to live by the law. You can try your best to follow all the rules and still miss heaven. The only way is through trusting in Jesus. The only way. Because I failed. You failed. And when we try to keep all the laws, you're going to fail miserably. The pool may have only been sitting inches away. We don't know from this man. He could have been this far from the pool, but he couldn't reach it. Someone in the back could have beat him because he could not move. And did you know you can miss heaven by so little? It doesn't matter. You must have Jesus. But then we see here, not only that, we see the wonderful cure. Look at verses 8 and 9. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. See, Jesus did not pronounce some word of, mere, of healing. He didn't do that. But what he merely commanded to do was three different things that we see here in this passage of Scripture. First of all, Jesus told him to rise. How's this man going to get up? He commands to him, rise. Jesus asked him to do what seemed impossible to man. The very word of Christ to rise would enable the lame man to stand up. And did you know for that second there when Jesus said rise, he began to move up and he thinks, what in the world's going on here? And here he comes. He says, rise. 
See, God never tells us to do something without enabling us to do it. And here Jesus said, rise to this man that is lame. Jesus did the same thing when he healed the man with the lithered hand in Luke 6, verse number 10. When he attempted to rise, he was demonstrating his faith. If he believed, he would rise. And then next of all, what does he tell him here? You understand, we got this here with commas in this verse of Scripture. He said, take up your bed. Why did he tell him that? He said, take it up and do something with it. Because you're not going to need it anymore. You're not going to need that anymore. He was not to make provision for his former state of life. The Bible tells us, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. See, when the Lord brings you out of something that you've been in for a long time, He says, do that something with that. Get rid of it because you're not going to need it anymore. Looking at things you shouldn't be looking at. Involved with those activities that you once were involved with. Do away with those things. Because following after Jesus means you're not going to need any of that garbage anymore. Follow after Jesus. But then another one here. Walk is another command that he gave. See, when God saves a person, it will show up in their walk. This is amazing when you think about it. This... Lame man has been laying there for 38 years. And then what does Jesus say? He says, rise, take up thy bed, and then walk. And I guarantee you there were a lot of people there that probably recognized that guy. And they looked at him. You were taking a look at something, and you looked away, and you thought, whoa. This guy's been laying here all this time. He's walking around. How did this happen? What happened here? See, the lame man had a choice to make. He could either obey or argue and say, Hey, I just don't think this will work. But I believe there was something in that man's heart and in his mind. He believed this is something different. And he rised, took it up, and walked. The man did everything the Lord said and he was healed. The first place he walked to to testify was the temple. In chapter, the same chapter, verses 14 through 15. And guess what? Jesus didn't just forget about him, but he met him there and talked about him. See, attending church and testifying for Christ is one of the first priorities in a new Christian's life. Following after in believer's baptism, coming to church, getting involved, those are priorities that are important. So here we come to the last part. This is all good, but then we see some wicked criticism. Let's look at these verses together, verse 9 through 18. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked on the same day was the Sabbath. Uh Uh-oh, you know that's going to grab some attention of some people, right? The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. If they had ties, they probably pulled their ties up when they said that. It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed that you have picked up. What do you think you're doing? He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. That's what he told me to do. Then asking They asked him, What man is that which said that unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not when it was for Jesus had conveyed himself away a multitude being in that place. Afterward Jesus finding him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. Lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. And sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hereto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. 
Woo. You're talking about making some people mad. The religious leaders were mad. See, on the Sabbath day, verse number 9, the Bible records seven occasions when Jesus healed on the Sabbath day. This impotent man at the pool of Bethesda, casting out an unclean spirit at the synagogue in part Capernaum, healing Peter's mother-in-law at Capernaum, healing a withered hand in the synagogue, the crooked woman made upright, the healing of a man with the dropsy, and then the man born blind healed in Jerusalem. All of this occurring on the Sabbath day, and the religious leaders did not like what was going on. See, the ridiculous criticism we find here in verse number 10, rather than rejoicing in the man's healing, they probably had seen, word probably got out, and instead of rejoicing about the man's healing, the Jews were upset about him carrying a little bed. They'd rather him go lay back down and take his bed to where he's going instead of rejoicing over the fact that a man that had been lame for 38 years was up walking around with everybody else. I've said this before and I'll tell you it again. If something like this were to happen today, every news station in America across this world would say someone that was lame in their entire life has risen up to walk. All news stations would carry it. People would be intrigued. They'd be thinking, what in the world's going on? How did this actually happen? But here with these religious leaders, here within this area, the people that are there, they're upset over a petty thing of carrying a bed. See, the Jews formulated 39 rules forbidding certain activities on the Sabbath and mostly are by tradition and not Scripture. They turn what God intended to be a blessing into a burden. Rules like this. No weaving two loops. If you weave two loops, you're just out. Weaving two threads, separating two threads, no tying, untying, no tearing, no writing down two letters or erasing two letters, no sewing, etc. Rule number 39 forbid transporting an object into the public domain. And they said, gotcha. You know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in the rules in church. Did you know that? People got to dress a certain way. People got to wear this. They got to wear that. If they don't cut their hair the right way, if they do this, if they do that, we can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth about it. We get so wrapped up in the rules. What we really need to get wrapped up in is falling in love with Jesus. Not the rules, but falling in love with Jesus. When you fall in love with Jesus, you'll forget about all those nitpicky things. You'll forget about all those trivial things. This showed that they were not concerned about the most important thing. And the most important thing was this man had walked for the first time in 38 years. But also the reasonable comeback. When confronted about carrying his bed, the man answered this. He that made me whole, he said the same unto me, take up thy bed and walk. He wasn't complaining anymore. He came to Jesus' defense. He said, he told me to take up my bed and walk. It was obvious to him that since this man could make him walk, his word was better than these ridiculous critics. He said, this bed you're talking about, you're getting upset about, here, you have it. You take it with you. I don't need it. If you want it, you take it. But also the reassuring confidence Because Jesus shunned publicity at this time, he exited the scene without attracting any more attention. But Jesus was not going to abandon him. Jesus found him in the temple and reassured him. The man became a witness for the Lord in the temple that day. But also lastly here, the reflection of Christ. See, the Jews sought to slay Jesus for violating the Sabbath. In actuality, they were the ones distorting the meanings of the Sabbath, the meaning of it. And what was the meaning of the Sabbath? The intent of the Sabbath was not inaction, but satisfaction, not refraining from work, but reflecting on a work 
well done. Jesus was a reflection of the activity of the Father. God the Father continues to work on the Sabbath. The sun rises, rain falls, crops grow, life is sustained. And the claim that Jesus was a deity and that is what initiated the Jews to start planning his death. How dare you say that you're the Son of God? How dare you say these things? You're speaking blasphemy. But they did not see the truth because they were blinded. But here we see in this passage of Scripture a man for 38 years that one day he walked, or or he didn't walk, he was carried or brought to this situation. And he probably thought, it's going to be another day, same old song and dance. Someone's going to get there before me and believe that they can be healed. And I'm going to leave this place once again disappointed but little did he know the master was coming that day and it wasn't surprised by him Jesus seeing him there I believe Jesus knew him there before he got there he was coming there to this situation and when Jesus came he walked in and this man for the first time in 38 years rose to his feet in newness of life and was able to walk out of this situation and that's what happens To a person that is lost in their sins and accepts Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. They die to the old self and they become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And they walk differently. Not being the same old same old, but being different and having a life forever changed. There may be someone here today that is lost and in need of a Savior. I'm telling you today, by trusting in Jesus, He's a life changer. He will forever change you. But also today there may be some here that are just defeated. They're disappointed with their life and how it's going. They've got a lot of things heavy upon their lives, on their plate. I reassure you this morning that God will give you what you need to help you to deal with those situations, to help you along this difficult path in life. But today, what is it for you? That's a question only you can answer. Is today a day of salvation? Or maybe today you just need to come pray. Whatever it is, I encourage you to come as we give this invitation this morning. If you would, stand with me. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time to be able to come together corporately to worship. I thank you, Father, for your word today. And I pray that you will work in lives where work is needed, Father. And if someone needs Jesus today, I pray they would come that is in need of a Savior. Or maybe today someone just needs to come pray. I pray they'd come. We love you once again. We we thank you so much for all you do. Thank you for how wonderful and marvelous that you are. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. been good to be here this morning and uh, I'm going to ask you just to stand for just a few more moments and I'm going to call the men and their spouses if they would come up and meet with me today. Um, if y'all want to
come on up and stand with me. Uh, like I mentioned, I had a surprise for you, and uh, this will just take just a couple of moments. Uh, we've been talking about deacons for a while and uh, looking at some men that we want to serve um, our church and their families, and it's a, it's a family thing. And just to let you know, these here before me, I'll stand up here, let y'all stand down here. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, we have Brother Jerry, and we have Pete, and we have uh, Justin, and we have Keith. And their families are up here with them today. And next Sunday, uh, we are going to be voting to make Jerry and Keith active deacons. They have been ordained already, and they have accepted the call uh, to be here at the church and to serve our church family. And then Pete and Justin are going to be going through some training. I'm going to walk alongside with them, going through a book, and we're going to be training them. And then in February, we are going to be ordaining Pete and Justin to be um, active deacons but next Sunday we will be voting to accept them all for them to go through the the training and then the ordination service but I just wanted to let you know that these are the loving smiles and loving families that you'll see as we in the coming days will be uh, looking forward to uh, serving the church through ministry and I have a model that I'd like to set up each deacon will be responsible for families in the church and uh, also we have brother Walt he is our other deacon, and he has served this church faithfully for a very long time. And uh, he is going to continue to be a deacon here at the church also. So um, we will have these five men that will serve the body, and hopefully after the ordination service we'll have everything set up to where they can serve. So I just wanted you to see them, see their face, and then next Sunday we're going to vote. And then I'm looking forward to February when we have an ordination service. The whole service that morning will be the ordination. It will be all about deacons and serving. So I'm praying you'll be a part of that as we ordain these two men here. But so thankful for their, them, their families, and uh, looking forward to how God is going to continue to bless this church. And I think this is only a step in the right direction because having more men in leadership and serving the church is only a good thing. So we're going to be really looking forward with great anticipation for what God's going to do. But thank you all so much for coming up. And um, we're going to go ahead and dismiss in a word of prayer. And then I'll be at the back to say um, uh, till next time when we meet Wednesday night. And like I said last Sunday, if you don't come on Wednesdays, we'd love to have you and be a part. If you don't come for Sunday school, come try Sunday school out. We have fabulous teachers that do an awesome job preparing. So come out. If you're here today for the first time, we'd love for you to come back. And uh, let's go ahead and dismiss um, in a word of prayer. Um, Patrick, will you pray for us? My father-in-law's here today. I'll get him to pray. <laughs>